They always talking about how we young people never try to do nothing but use dope and kill each other up in the street. Then when we try to do something the way they say it's supposed to be done, they mess with us and try to shut us down. Those people up there look down here and they see one little black country girl organizing a bunch of kids that society with all their money in their brains said there was no saving. You scare them. You scare them because you embarrass them. Please hold you welcome to the stage, Jerry Hayes. Thank you so much for joining us for this day. The, I, I think the film is so remarkable. It's an incredible work and an incredible document of the time. Um, Start, could you talk a little bit about perhaps how you met John Fanaka and got involved in the film? Well, I was a student in the film and the theater department, and Jamal was a student in the film department. So it was a normal thing that um, theater students would act in the films for the film students because they, they needed for their grades. So one day Jamal came to me and he said, he saw me on campus, he said, I wrote a script for you. And I said, yeah, sure. And I kept walking. <laughs> so in his style, he waited until he finished. And um, when he finished it, he gave it to me. <clears throat> then he asked me to audition. I'm like, all oh, right, <laughs> you don't give me this. You don't ask me, tell me you wrote a script for me, he asked me to audition. So that's how I am. Much like the character and, and Jamal's well, you were I think, born in the South and yes. moved out to LA. I was born in Alabama. Um, my mother passed away when I was very young also. Um, and I ended up in LA, but I went a few other places before. So my father was in the military. Did you, I mean, obviously there was that connection with the character. Did you help to shape it more, sort of maybe beyond what was kind of the script originally? Well, since we were all students, um, the film wasn't totally directed like a professional film. Um, Jamal allowed everybody to use their creativity. Sometimes I think too much. Um, I really directed myself most of the time because that's the way he wanted it. So I remember the first time we saw the film after it was finished, and it was at UCLA. And one of the professors came out, and actually, he, Jamar and I both were, I guess, famous, if I should say that. So he came out and he said, Jerry, um, you don't have to tell me you directed yourself. So I had him for a lot of um, acting classes. So. Was there a lot of sort of, you know, improv or anything like that on set, or was it for sticking to a script? Um, it was mostly, we did stick to the script, but there was some improv, and as a matter of fact, um, I even wrote mm -hmm. some, especially a well, big piece was the monologue when Emma May was leaving home. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my real mother on the wall. <laughs> And um, since I lost at a very early age, which has always been a part of my life, so I asked Jamar if I could put him in the, in the family, he said yes. So when that scene came up, I told him something's missing. He said, what's missing? I said, something's missing, Jamar. He said, well, maybe right. <laughs> so I brought, after I wrote my <coughs> monologue, I showed it to him, he said, fine. So. That time at UCLA seems like it was such an incredible artist in the film, obviously the film department there. Can you talk a little bit about being at UCLA at that time? I mean, I was sitting there and tears came to my eyes. Of course, um, um, I hate to get emotional, but it was one of the most beautiful and fulfilling times of my life. Um, there were about, I think, maybe 500 students in the theater department, and 
it was like 50 black students. Um, but it seems like when it came to the arts, color didn't matter. The theater students became a family. So we would see each other. We had a green room, just like they have in the professional um, theaters. And we would meet there in the morning. We would meet there before we left in the evening. And we would meet there between classes. Um, it was a wonderful time. It was almost like, I guess in a way, um, the 70s. I would say it was um, a time of um, a revolution in this country as when we look at it as far as black and white. Um, but at the same time, um, my stay, my time at UCLA was very beautiful. It was very educational in the classroom, outside the classroom, because there were students from all over the world. And you would mingle with them and you would get an education from them also. I think one of the things I find really remarkable about the film is it's addressing so many issues of that moment and yet sadly it still seems so incredibly relevant today. Um, could you talk a little bit about seeing, seeing the film you know, in 2017? Well, let's go back to uh, 2011. I hadn't seen Jamar in many years because I left LA and uh, we were kind of estranged from each other. So I talked to him maybe two years before and then we didn't talk again. So I got home one day, 2011, and Jamar had left me a message and you know, he's gonna always be the storyteller and he's gonna make everything sound good. So he said, oh, we're, we're having a screening of Emma May out here in LA and people are asking about you and uh, I would just love for you to share the stage with me. So and eventually I called him back. I wasn't really sure that I wanted to go for the reason that I left behind something that I loved so much that was such a part of me um, that I didn't know how it would affect me. So Jamar talked to me and um, he never takes no good answer. So eventually I went. So um, I hadn't seen MMA on the big screen for a long time. So I saw myself sitting there and you know, I wasn't looking at the film as me playing MMA, I was just looking at the film. Um, it was relevant then. Um, sadly, it is relevant today. A lot of the things that happened in the film, I would wish we had gone past and it seemed like we surpassed it and then I don't know, it seemed like we went backwards a little bit. Um, that's basically how I feel about it. Are there any questions in the audience? Yes, great. I feel like in a lot of films when a woman is a hero, she's also uh, ex exploited in a way that diminishes her. But I kind of feel like in this film, MMA was not diminished. In fact, she was respected and everybody was on her side. And I was wondering if if you connected that with that in the in the script, and, and if maybe that's why you wanted to do it, or if you know. I don't think so. Yeah. Um, I read the script. It was a challenge. Jamar told me that Emma May was a story about his cousin. So I just tried to lift the character off the page and make a character, you know, make the character come to life. And I don't think I look forward in, a, in any type of way as to what if she was, uh, you know, positive. It was just I was MMA. Um, I guess it's so interesting because to me, at that time, it was another student film. Something we did all the time, on a regular basis. But Jamal, he had the vision. Um, I can't sit here 
with Al, talking about my friend Jamal. Um, he passed away in 2012. And I think I've thought about him every day since. Um, after I went to LA, um, for the next, it was only like four months left that he was alive. And we spoke every day, and sometimes more than once a day. Jamar knew that he was dying, but I didn't. He tried to tell me when I look back, but I suppose he saw I just couldn't accept it. So I guess he just allowed me to enjoy every moment that you know we spoke. Um, he said something one time like, I will be with you through eternity. And he will. I know he will. Uh, in my heart and in my mind. Um, we were talking about working together again. I think what Jamar probably knew that was a very slim chance that would happen. But I didn't know that. Um, but he said to me, why don't you write? And he asked me twice, um, can you write? I said, I can't write you. So the third time he asked me, he said, you can. So I've been slowly trying to complete this book and dedicate it to my friend, Jamal, because he touched my life in a way no one else ever will. He took a chance on me to play MMA, and I was not a film actress. I always did stage. So when I look at the film now, sometimes I can see some places it's, it's bigger. You know, it's more like for the stage, it's not for the film. But we have to realize this was student film, um, very low budget. So Jamal couldn't always go back and, you know, shoot again. So he would take the best of what he had and go with it. And How do you, since Screen Home, the film's really been kind of rediscovered, it's screened around the country. Mm -hmm. How has that been for you, sort of having this work sort of come back? Well, that's a little bittersweet. So when Jamal came back into my life, he came back in a positive way. And I always say, I thought it was a um, new beginning, but it turned out to be a long goodbye. Um, I think we both regretted the times that, you know, we were away from each other and we realized how much we had always respected each other and loved each other for the creativity. Um, but once he passed, a lot of things changed. And that's why I say it's been sweet. Um, Jamal had told me every, a lot about the L.A. Rebellion. So, had he been alive, he would have been more of a part of it. And I'm sure I would have too. Because when we were shooting the film, every day Jamal went to see the rushes, as they're called, whatever he shot the day before, he always took me with him. And I was shocked when I went back to LA in 2011, and Jamal had become a millionaire, um, that he still respected my opinion on things. I think we kind of balance each other out a little bit. But, um, so that's, that's where that stands. Any other questions? Yes, right here. I'm just, if, if you can, if you can share stories about some of the other cast members in the movie and, and what it was like to work with them. Um, most of the cast, not Jesse, I met Jesse, um, may he rest in peace, he passed away six months after Jamar did. Um, I didn't know him. I met him on the set for the first time um, when we started shooting. He was very arrogant. <laughs> and I, I don't think he realized it was a student film and there was no money, you know, real money. He won a limo. <laughs> I don't remember what Jamal did. I don't know if he just broke, because Jamar's the type of person, okay, if this is what I have to do, this is what I have to do. So I don't know if he actually got the limo, I can't remember. But um, a majority of the student, of the 
carriages were fellow students. Um, James was a student. Um, um, Zeke <laughs> was a student. Um, so the majority of the main characters were students. Had you done stage work with any of them before, or was it you just sort of moved up in the community? No, no, no. I didn't know them before mm -hmm. because when I um, started, um, became a student at UCLA, I was actually transferring from the theater department to San Jose State. So I didn't know any of them. I met them all on campus. So by the theater department being such a close knit group, then we all ended up either working together in some capacity, and then we would even socialize on weekends. And then you were sitting around each other, because like some students would find a spot on campus to relax in between classes, but um, the theater students always gravitated back to the theater department. So, you know, you saw each other all the time. We have time for about one more question. Yes. Oh, Jamar directed quite a few films. See, Emma May was supposed to have been Jamar's master thesis film. Um, but um, there was a problem afterwards. So Jamar stayed in, in school at UCLA and did two or three more films because Jamar did Penitentiary, one, two, and three. So Penitentiary actually is the film that made him a millionaire. Um, he told me about Emma May. He said, actually, Emma May was his favorite because it was about a cousin. Plus, he had family members in Emma May, and they had all passed on. So he said, this is what he told me um, during our last talks. And he said, so Jerry, every time I see Emma May, I get a tear in my eye. Well. Now, when I see Emma May, I get a tear in my eye because um, um, my best friend is gone. And I can't think of words to express the type of friend he was. Um, he was one of the most brilliant men that I ever know. But at the same time, he was so humble. So, Thank you so much for coming out today. Thank you. Thank you. Now y'all listen to this little lady and get your hearts together. Talk about taking chances. What do you think you're doing every time you pick up a gun and get the so-called gang warrant with your own people over turf? Something don't none of your own because the white man owns it. That's right. The white man owns every nook and every cranny, every alley and every freeway, every city and every goddamn swamp. The white man owns it. Why? Because he got up off of his ass and took it. Now, y'all want a piece of it? Well, the only way you're going to get it is to get up off of your asses and take it back. And y'all got the nerve to be talking about worrying about face and time. Face and time. Nigga, you face time every day you live and breathe while you're doing time right now and don't even know it. Y'all always jiving with me about my mumbling. See, what you don't know is I mumble to forget. That's right. When I mumble, I forget that I'm ashamed to be as old as I am and still walking around. Why, if I was anybody at all, I'd be dead. I ain't shit, and I know it. But y'all listen to me, and listen to that little lady over there, because what she's trying to tell you, you at least stand a chance to get something out of it. Yeah, that is besides laughing and bragging over how many brothers you done shot and killed in some fool gang war. Now sit your funky asses down and listen to a real woman for a change. <laughs>